Hello, everybody. We are back with Stephen M. Plim. You remember him from our episode about Mr. Plim and Tiny Tim. And our guest that night was Vince Russo. And because of that show, Mr. Plim, we have had such a response. You don't even know, brother. We have wow. set such a response to bring you back. We had to do it all over again. I appreciate Joining it. me down this, uh, this journey down the, uh, the show business rabbit hole is my cohort, my co-host, my partner in crime, a man who I love like a brother from another mother. I got two brothers from other mothers here tonight. <laughs> Dan, the man, Sebastiano, the happy haberdash. How you doing, brother? Good, Angelo. Looking forward to uh, another good talk. Stephen, we had a lot of fun talking to him last time, so it should be great. Yeah, I wanted Stephen to come back to talk about Stephen Plim, agent, manager, Hollywood renaissance guy. Um, I, want to, I want all the juice. I want to know what goes on behind the scenes. Uh -oh. But before we bring Stephen in... We got to talk about a couple of things that transpired on the show recently. Dominic DiNucci's episode has garnered a lot, a lot of attention. Um, people are saying that our interview with Dominic was among the best, if not the best interview with Dominic they've ever heard. And I got, I'll show you, I'm going to put them up on our Facebook group. Um, and I was like, I almost brought the tears on that one. That was like really touching. That people thought that we were that, you know, true to uh, to Dominic. The other thing is, I was given a piece of information today, Dan, that I shared with you, and we need to address this because we did address this on our episode with uh, Vince Russo and Mike Williams, along with uh, our our former partner here, uh, Mike Messier, the uh, director filmmaker. Um, the issue in question is whether or not George Floyd, the, uh, the resident of Detroit, was uh, killed as a result of police brutality or whether there was some other nefarious um, actions at work. I shared with you. Well, why don't you just go ahead and share with the audience well, what I shared with quick, you? Uh, not to. Not to correct you, you said Detroit. George Floyd was uh, killed in Minneapolis. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm sorry. The, um, and I, I, the reason this came to our attention, because uh, Sam Houston, friend of the show, posted posted the link up, um, not to call anybody out, but the, the narrative that's being floated uh, that's come from the defense team is they're going to argue, and, and it's exactly what Mike Williams said he expected, was the defense team's going to argue that due to the drugs in his system, he suffered basically a heart attack, and an overdose-induced heart attack, regardless of the choke that was applied. Yeah, and, and that was important because we addressed George Floyd's di death directly on our show, keeping in mind... And I'm, I make this disclaimer legally, keeping in mind the information we used that was provided to us was current as of the time of the recording of that show. Correct. The information we have today is not our information. I want to be very clear to say that it is not our information. It comes, as Dan said, by way of Michael Sam Houston, better known as Sam Houston, a uh, professional wrestler of some 30 years, uh, a friend of the show. He's been here twice already. He's a friend of mine personally. I know him and I like him. Uh, and, he, and he's a straight up guy. Go ahead. And the, I was going to say the, the article in question came, was published, I believe, yesterday from the yeah. Washington Sentinel, which is, while, while right-leaning, hardly a – it's a respected jur uh, journalistic enterprise. Yes, yes, Absolutely. Uh, so, but we need to make sure that we we you know caveat this by saying it is not our information. It was brought to our attention, and in the interest of full disclosure, we are sharing it with the public. That being said, Dan, yes, introduce sir. our guest of the evening. <clears throat> well, uh, I mean, we touched on it in the in, in your intro. Uh, Stephen Plim, author, b uh, Booker, uh, producer. Agent, madman of any many sorts, mad hatter, I should say, man of many, many hats. Um, uh, I mean, just uh, it's it, 
we could spend an hour show just covering an in- an introduction. But I think the, no the shit. <laughs> he was Stephen. Stephen uh, came to the show. Uh, his book, uh, Tiny Tim and Mr. Plim, which was his adventures and time as manager of legendary mm-hmm. musician Tiny Tim, brought Vince Russo. You mentioned you wanted to touch more on. Obviously, we could continue talking about the book, but there was so much more to his life as far as agenting and and various other facets that we want to get into. And that's why he's here. We're going to touch on, as you said, agenting 101, basically. Absolutely. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk more about Stephen and less about Tiny Tim is, quite frankly, Stephen, Vince Russo is going to blow you up with questions about Tiny Tim. (laughs) I liked him a lot. I should I should point out to everybody. I spoke to Vince Russo today. Uh, I invited him to appear on the show tonight. He has a very full plate. He's actually recording his show tonight for broadcast tomorrow. Uh, and he's got, as as everyone knows, Vince has uh, right now 13 different shows on his network that require his attention. So wrestling with the future is certainly not at the top of his uh, priority list. But. Stephen Plim is at the top of our priority list tonight. Stephen, welcome back. How you doing? Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure being here. And I loved Vince. He was great. Yeah, and I told him that. By the way, he, uh, as I promised, and just I want Dan to know I'm a man of my word, I <laughs> promised to send Vince Russo Stephen's book. And I did, along with Wrestling with the Future t-shirts, which he will wear. He says he will. So... Oh, speaking of which, not to change the subject, but thank you. Shout out to Stefan Bonner. Right on, brother. Great shirt. I like that shirt you're wearing. Stefan Bonner, of course, former UFC champion, MMA fighter, uh, just amazing legend in MMA, sporting a Wrestling with the Future t-shirt. And I spoke to Stefan, and he will be back on the show in about uh, three weeks. Awesome. Just as soon as he gets back from Dubai. There you go. If they let him back. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be back. So, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, in it, let's let's talk about in as much as you, uh, you handled Tiny Tim for five years, but you were his friend for 25 years. Um, let's get into a little bit of your duties. You joking, you jokingly heard me say, I mean, yeah, I'm mean, asking. Did I say that right, Dan? Jokingly heard me saying. Yes. On the last episode, that you are his uh, agent, manager, uh, food order taker, the guy that tucked him in bed at night, and with Tiny Tim, probably most of that was true. Although I exaggerated. Tell me what you do as an agent, as a manager, and what is the difference? Let's de- let's first of all decipher and declare the difference between what an agent is and what a manager is. Go ahead. That's a great question because most people don't know. Okay, uh, an agent is a person that knows the entertainment business. Okay, and does it for a living, but he acquires jobs, work for his client. That's his function. Book me here. Book me there. Get paid. Get your 10 or 15%. Make sure I have as much work as I can possibly get. It's simply getting the artist jobs. Management is a whole different shake of the stick. That entails every, directing directing the guy's career. Uh, from anything, uh, press releases, working with agents, okay? Because many managers like myself, and I used to be an agent, but <clears throat> you always aspire to be a manager. Okay? You always aspire to that. I'm a personal manager. That's like the top of the heap for us guys, right? And uh, I'm not an agent anymore. But you deal with agents 24 hours a day, a myriad of agents uh, for your clients. Unless you sign one, th- unless I, as a manager, sign one of my uh, talents with exclusively with an agency. And then that's it. They do the job. However, we communicate all day long. What they do uh, for the manager is they bring us, it's called offers. I'm sure you understand that. Offers. Actually, Stephen, can I stop you there? Because I understand that and Dan understands that. But 
there are a number of ways to interpret what an offer is. And you and I both know that having been in the business. There are people who will make an offer and there will people who who will bring an offer. Explain to people the difference between making an offer and bringing an offer. You can bring me an offer on the phone and say uh, X amount of dollars, this, that, and that, and we meet your uh, writer requirements, what have you. Right. That's, you brought me an offer. You're going to make me an offer? That's solid. Make me an offer go. on the phone. Fax that over to me right away. This is solid. This is your word. This is the offer from your buyer. And we're going to go with that. Now, yes. I take it to my artist. I nine times out of ten already know whether we're going to accept it or not. But you don't accept right away. It's just you don't do that. <laughs> okay. Stephen, how often do you get somebody who says, okay, Mr. Plim, you've got carte blanche. You field the offers, accept them. You well, just get me work, you know, get me booked, get me paid, get me work. You've got carte blanche. How many uh, clients have you had? I mean, other than tiny mm -hmm. who I can't see tiny really arguing with anyone. No, he, he trusted you right. implicitly, Stephen. He really, really did. But let's say you have an, an artist that's just like, who quite frankly doesn't give a shit and says, okay, just you, you handle it. it I don't want to be bothered with the business. You handle right. it. it. It runs that way. Or <clears throat> perhaps you have a really good relationship with your artist. You work the, with them for a while. They believe in you and they give you a uh, power of attorney. Okay. Mm -hmm. That means that on any phone call, if I like the deal, I'm accepting it solidly right now. It's just like the artist speaking. I don't have to bring him the offer, go over uh, all the details. And then I always suggest, I'll make my, I think we should take this. Or here's why I don't think that we should take this. Or we're in agreement to take it, but there needs to be a little tweaking here in the writer or this or that, and then it'll be fine. So you go back to the agent or the buyer, if he's calling you direct, and you negotiate. Just like anything else in business, you negotiate. My job is to get the best deal for my client as a manager. I'm fighting a guy, the agent. Okay, if, if I'm working with an agent and I'm a manager, he's fighting actually for the buyer. Because he's going to work with that buyer many times a year. He wants to get the buyer the best deal he can to look as good as he can so yeah. he can keep dealing with them. My best interest and my artist's best interest is not the agent's. They'll say it is, okay? Hey, baby, I love you. I got you a great gig. Wait yeah. till you hear this. Oh, my God, you're going to love it. And we got you this. We got you that. We got that. Okay? They make it, they embellish it as much as they possibly can because they want to sell it to their buyer, be in good with their buyer for the future, and get their commission, okay? And we all Absolutely. know how the game's played. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, Um. well, then, then let me ask you to expand on that because you talked about uh, the, the, how, bringing the offers and the manager and the agent, how often then do the manager and the agent have to work together and how often do their interests conflict? Hmm. Well, there's That's just a, <laughs> there's always a conflict between an agent and a manager because we both have two different functions and we're looking at the deal from two different perspectives, as I just uh, mentioned. But the nice thing, if you've been in the business a long time, like I have, you develop relationships with agents because you've worked with them so long. And now you develop it. Okay, where I know I can trust this guy because he's always come through for me. You know, he's not yeah. going to bust my balls. He's not going to lie to me. We have a deal going. The, the problem is when you work with a, a brand new guy, you don't know his background. You know, the, so you have to question everything. Okay. Well, Stephen, following up on on what Dan just and I'm going to throw it back to Dan in just a second, but following up on what Dan just talked about, what's yeah. the difference between a buyer? And I've heard this term used and I never understood it. What's the difference between a buyer and a broker? Oh, OK. Uh, and I've done both because I've owned nightclubs myself. Also, I was a buyer. <laughs> OK, a broker. Uh, and I've done that. 
I've brokered deals, just like a real estate thing, okay? You're not on either side. Uh, a buyer may call you and say, gee, Steve, I've got this big deal coming up. He tells me, here's how many seats, here's what it's for, here's my budget. Find me something that fits my needs. Okay? Stephen, is, is the broker status largely, you know, like Switzerland, is it neutral? Uh, like, what's the vested interest? Is it just a payday? Um, like someone, like a buyer, I'm, I'm assuming a buyer has a vested interest in dealing with particular agents and managers, right? Yeah. Because they, they get a piece of, I'm assuming they get a piece of that, right? Whereas no. a broker, no, no, no. Okay. Fill, no. Smarten us up. What did you say again? What was that question? Uh, the, 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 uh, the idea or the notion that a broker is neutral, right? Uh -huh. They get, they get paid uh, a flat fee or do they have a vested interest? No, I they get know paid. That, no, I'm sorry. They get paid a flat fee for bringing two entities together. And that fee is discussed up front. Okay. That's what uh, you went exactly where I, I was hoping you'd go. Yeah. Because say, my I, understanding yeah. is that a broker has a vested interest in the client, right? Well, or it, no, it could go either way. Okay. Or it could be neutral. Like you said, like usually a broker, right? Uh, deals with agents and buyers, right? And they come to the broker because he has a good reputation and knows the business. Right. And how to put deals together quickly between a buyer and an agent or a buyer and an artist manager. So Give me usually an example. A broker, okay, a broker will have, okay, an example. Uh, the Fountain Blue in Miami Beach, right, is looking for X type of an act. He's having no luck or he's not satisfied. He knows a broker, or he knows me, and I'm brokering deals, right? He calls me, he says, Plim, here's what I'm looking for. Here's my budget. Put this to bed for me, will you? I'm tired of working with this crap, right? right. I said, okay. What's the budget on the thing? Let's say it's $50,000. Okay, I want 10 grand. It'll be included in the deposit. There's my fee. Is that okay with you? Yeah. I go to the uh, artist or the manager, and I tell him the same thing. What do you need? Here's the offer. It's 50 grand. I'm putting 10 on top for me. To get the deal done. Okay with you? It's all up front. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Well, then let me ask you. Let's kind of talk about the whole process then. If I'm, hypothetically speaking, let's say I'm a musician and there's a particular club or venue that I want to play. Um, who, from from start to finish, how does a, how do you, who goes through that process from the guy who owns the nightclub to the, to the artist themselves that's involved in that process of booking him that for an, a show? An artist wants to play a certain venue, he'll tell his agent and he expects his agent to get him the gig. It's that. So do, does the agent reach out to then the brokers or does the agent reach out to the person who owns the club? He'll reach out to the person that owns the club first. And almost always. He'll call him directly, and uh, whether he's been a client before or not, he'll pitch him his artist. Stephen, okay. I have heard horror stories <laughs> of artists dealing direct with concert and show promoters. Should an artist ever deal with a promoter themselves, or should they always be represented? Well, it's like the old saying uh, with a lawyer. A lawyer representing himself is not a good deal, right? Right. The best have, way is for a client. Cool for a client, yeah. 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 The best way is to always be represented. It's hard to sell yourself and brag about yourself and say how wonderful you are and what you're going to do. It sounds so damn self-serving. You need an agent to do the job for you. However, it happens where an artist will go directly to a club. He, maybe he knows the guy. Or yeah. he knows uh, another artist that played there and he was recommended to call him. And now you got a little three-way three thing going here, right? Yeah. And that's cool. It's all legal, you know. But I'm telling sure. you, 90% of the time, uh, it's not good to represent yourself unless in specific situations. Well, speaking, speaking of representation then, 
what's more likely for a manager to have one client that he specifically works with or an agent to have one client that he specifically works with? Good an point, Dan. Many, an agent will have many clients. He can't live off one artist, okay? Uh, a manager can. Unless your name is Colonel Tom Parker and your client exactly. is Elvis Presley. Oh, I am so glad. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, can, hey, can I tell you a quick story on that? You said Colonel Parker? Yes, oh, absolutely. Sir. Dig this, man. This is funny. I fell off my chair when I heard this. Okay. When, El when Elvis, you know, was the biggest thing in the world, right? And he was going, and Colonel Parker was known to be a ferocious, a ferocious lion. To deal Brutal. With. Brutal. Brutal. No gloves on, baby. Right? So right. the story goes like this. I wasn't there, but I talked to a guy that was there. He told me the story. Okay. When Presley went to make his first movie, his very first movie, uh, all the executives are gathered in the room around a big table. I think it was Columbia. I, I forget who it was. Okay. It was Paramount Pictures and it was Love Me Tender. And I know the story. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, they're all sitting around nervous as hell because they're going to meet with the colonel to negotiate a deal. You already know it, don't you, Angela? Oh, and boy. They're going to make a I'm deal. And everybody's nervous about who's going to speak first and what are we going to offer the colonel because he's such a hard ass, right? And they, and they don't want to piss him off and, have, and take it somewhere else. So they're all sitting around fidgeting. The meeting, long story short, the meeting comes to order. And uh, finally, one of these suits says, well, colonel, uh, what do you think about 100000 the guy said the colonel took a great big drag of his cigar and he said, that's fine for me. What about the boy? And it's exactly what he said. Is that great? And that was the that was the beginning <laughs> of the first million dollar contract in the film business. Elvis got a million dollars and Colonel Parker got two fifty for himself. Wow. You know, two more and about a it half for himself. Wow. Great. Elvis got a million dollars a picture from Love Me Tender to uh, J I Rock the, 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 the last one he got a million for was uh, was called Charo. I remember that. And then it went up from there. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was a great story about the colonel. It's great. It is. A, and that's absolutely true that every word of that was true. I'm glad. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Well, then, then let me have you, that is funny. Let, let me have you expand because I was asking about, uh, you, obviously you said managers are more likely to be a sing, singles. Uh, then how does that come about in the sense of, you mentioned, obviously, you were telling us in the last show that when you took over as managing duties for Tiny Tim, how, how, how often is it to have a manager that's somebody like a Colonel, like a Parker, who's with you your whole career? Whereas some people will three, four, five managers deep X number of years in. Most, <clears throat> excuse me, most artists change managers several times in their career until they find the one. Okay. And uh, I mean, there have been others like Colonel uh, Chubby Checker's manager. I forget his name. Uh, he only managed Chubby Checker and they made a deal. You sing, I'll do the business 50 50 split. His Did name was that? Bob Narducci. Yes. <laughs> from Philadelphia. Yeah. I know because I uh, I knew Chubby Checker for a while. Don't forget, Stephen, I only did two things in my life. Wrestling and music. That's all I ever did. Well, I got one of them. That's all I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> but along those lines, and, so, and thank you, Dan, it's a great segue into this. Um, you were Tiny Tim's friend first. Yes. Which went a long way uh, for you being Tiny's manager. And even at that point when you said to Tiny, okay, I'm going to handle your career now, that took him by surprise. Wouldn't it have been a natural fit from the jump for you to take Tiny and and guide his career. You saw what other guys were doing to him. They were, they were bastardizing his career, Stephen. Yes, but at that time, uh, to digress for a minute, I met Tiny Tim when I was 21 years old. 
Right. That was my first booking with him. I was a young agent, okay? Um, and I had several, as they call, lounge groups, probably 70 or 80 lounge groups. That's what I was doing. And they yeah. go around the country, you know, to Ramada Inns, Holiday Inns, different venues and play. And that's how I made a living, right? 10% yeah. from all of them, book the hell out of them, work all, you know, you know and then you graduate up. So uh, after that first meeting with Tiny, yeah, we became friends. We exchanged numbers. We talked. We laughed. I was 21 years old, okay? I was not in that league yet. I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, so all those years that we knew each other, we would meet, talk, and as I went up the ladder, right, then I would hire Tiny myself for my yeah. own promotions and productions. I used to do uh, NFL celebrity shows. I would use the Chicago Bears and Minnesota Vikings, Dallas Cowboys, and so forth on their off season <clears throat> or alumni guys. And I would promote family shows and I would couple it up with the police department in each city. Yeah. So it's a variety show, fill the auditorium, the cops are playing the Vikings, novelty, what a show, right? But sure. then I would always hire what I'd call a special guest or a guest host to help sell tickets. He would show up and just shake hands and say, hi, and I'm here. That is how I started with Tiny to graduate our friendship because I would hire many, many uh, NFL shows and he loved it. Stephen, how long did it take you to become comfortable in your skin as an agent or, a, or well, forget about agent first, uh, as a promoter? And I can I can tell you, and I've you know Dan knows this. I've said this many times before. A lot of the guests who come on this show have paralleled my career as well, because I started out uh, as a DJ, and I managed uh, and promoted rock and roll bands. That was what I did, and then I became a sound engineer. But if, and you know what it's like working with bands; they can be very temperamental. Yeah. They can be uh, sometimes the infighting in a band will kill a band before they ever get booked. Oh, almost uh, 90% of them, man. Exactly. 90% of them coming up and they all, I'm going to do this. I can follow direction, blah, 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 blah. And the longer they're together than the infighting. I wanted to play that song. I think we should do this. Oh my God. It's babysitting every day. You pull your hair out. These and guys, that's you know? what we're going to talk about. You went right there, Stephen. How long did you did you find? I mean, how how much of this? I'm gonna rephrase my question. How much of this did you take before you refined your skills and felt comfortable in your own skin? You know that you felt confident enough that you could do effectively uh, justice for your client. Well, I had a couple experiences. But however, I would say to be direct. Uh, 83, 84, when I moved to New York City. Okay. And now, I, was uh, that because it was trial by fire, Stephen? Well, no. I mean, I, I've had a couple acts that are not mentioned in the book or anything like that, but uh, really, really got my personal career fired up. And one of them was, maybe you'll remember, uh, uh, a little girl, 10 years old, named Carrie McDowell. She was oh, singing. Sure. Sing yeah, I found her in Des Moines, Iowa, through a, a friend that had a TV show at the time, long story short, right? Yeah. And uh, we put together a band, all kids. You know, this is when the Jackson 5 and the Osmonds were hot, right? Yeah. So I was the entertainment director at a major hotel here, as well as doing my own stuff. And, and I would bring in big shows. And finally, mm -hmm. the guy comes to me and he goes, you know what? I want to do a thing like the Jackson 5 or the Osmonds. I looked at him like he was nuts. I said, what? We went out and had about 10 martinis, and he talked me into it. <laughs> I'll share a little story with you. <laughs> um, this It's interesting because this story crosses over from the music world to the wrestling world. <clears throat> the particular gentleman that uh, I will mention will be a guest on the show. And uh, he's a very dear friend of mine, personal friend of mine. His name is Rob Russin. Rob Russin uh, discovered the first, this is straight shoot, Stephen, you can check it out. The first Elvis tribute artist. Oh. The first one. Okay. Now, 
interestingly enough, and Dan will know this, Rob Russell also discovered a guy that became well-known in wrestling named Diamond Dallas Page. Okay? Okay. Diamond Dallas Page is a former world champion. But here's the thing. Rob Russell was an interesting cat because he had this approach to promoting his artist that was kind of like, I want to say like, it wasn't like the Colonel where he was like a bulldog, but he was, um, what's I would say, Dan, like a passive aggressive kind of personality. Like he was real good at like guilting his clients into shit. You know what (laughs) know where I'm going with this? Yeah. Okay. He's a guy like that. And, and, and that's just the truth. I mean, that's just the way. But Rob's a great guy, and he's very, very good at what he does. But are there different? I'm sure there are. Like there are artists. Are there different personalities that work for being a manager or agent, or that you have to have like, you know, brass cojones to do this job? Well. You've got to have a, have a lot of miles under your ass before you go into management. Okay. I'm just saying that's a straight shooting thing, right? Yeah. It's easy to say I'm a manager and you know how many people are in the pseudo entertainment business and they got a little band. I'm, this is my manager. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I'm George Burns. Give me a break. You know what I mean? <laughs> you gotta be there, pay your dues, make your connections, take, get shot down, pick yourself back up and learn. You know, it's PhD, man. It's, you know, an MBA in the business and there's no school for it. You just do it. And if you last long enough, if you're lucky to last long enough, right? Yeah. Maybe you can come about. Steven, did Tiny Tim understand how much money he ever made? Uh, from time to time. Tiny, Tiny was the worst businessman in the world, you know. He uh, had to have made multiple millions upon millions of millions of dollars, Stephen. Yeah, he did. His first big payday uh, was right after uh, uh, Tiptoe mm-hmm. uh, at uh, Caesars. 60000 a week in 69. Uh, That's a lot of money then. Sixty grand a week in 1969. Right. That was big That's money. That's unheard then. of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge money. Yeah. And he loved that. <laughs> wow. That's, but you know, un- yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Over the years, over all those years, he made millions of dollars, right? But he spent it like a drunken sailor, you know? He had no business acumen at all. Whatever he would make in one given week, Angelo, uh, it was gone by the next payday. Literally. He never had a bank account. It was all cash. And a funny thing, you know when you could always tell when Tiny got paid? Now check this out. He would limp. You know why? why? Thank you. <laughs> he would limp because just like in New York City, he said when he was poor, right? And you could get roughed up or mugged. So if you had any money, you put it in your shoe because that's the last place they look. <laughs> so if I saw a tiny I limp, where he's going. I knew he just got paid. And we'd sit down in the dressing room and go, oh, my leg, it hurts so much. And he'd pull out a wad of bills, you know, <laughs> like this and choke a horse. How he ever walked in those shoes with that money, I'll never know. But ahead, he had man. that habit. He grew up that way. That's crazy. Uh, out of curiosity, while you were telling that story, I looked <laughs> it up. Per the uh, official inf- uh, U.S. Economic Bureau's inflation calculator, $60,000 in 1969 is just under 425000 today's money. Oh, my um, God. Wow. That's a per, lot of dough. Per week. Per week. Per week. That's, yeah. That was, that's the equivalent of $1.2 million a month. And Tiny used to tell me, oh, I mean, I wasn't with him then, of course, but Tiny used to tell me, he said, Mr. Plim, when I was made at Caesars, because he'd never had this in his life, you know, he was a street urchin in New York City playing past the hat, right? Right. Tell the song, right? He said, I had a suite all by myself, a wonderful shower. They would bring me food, anything I wanted to my room. He was just like a kid in a candy store, man. And he said, this is for me, you know? Stephen, I got to 
uh, and Dan, I'm going to throw it back to you in just a second, but I got to say, something just struck me. You just said something super <clears throat> important, that Tiny was a street performer. Yeah. How many of those performers that you've seen, known, or handled, and one very, very famous one comes to mind, it, it recently passed away a couple of years ago, um, the, who who can't make it outside of that realm. One guy that comes to mind, I'm going to give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Robin Williams, the late Robin Williams. Wow, yeah. Started off as a street performer. Yeah, what a genius. And he was always of that mode. He was always a street performer. Yeah. And he was a, a man who was clearly... May he rest in peace, but he was clearly a guy who was not comfortable in his own skin for a long time. I think fame, and part of my language, but I think fame fucked with him. And I think in some regard, and, and I'm only I'm going to put this out there, you you know better than I do, and I'm certainly Dan will pick up on it. But Piney was one of those guys too that he didn't know how, or to me anyway, he seemed like he was always uncomfortable being a big star. Am I wrong about that? I would have to remind him sometimes because Tiny <clears throat> could get very depressed. Okay. Go ahead. And very religious and thank God for everything all the time. He, he I mean, he meditated and prayed four or five times a day, every day, right? Took five or six showers a day every day but sometimes he'd get really down you know and i can remember times more than often not, no, more often than not here's what worked and i would say it in different ways so i wasn't repeating myself so to speak i'd say tiny look at this when you walk in a restaurant what's everybody do they kiss your ass what table do you want what can i do for you oh let me buy you dinner here's a drink uh, if you want to, everybody stops as soon as you walk in. They want your autograph. They tell you how wonderful you are. On and on and on with the adjectives and adverbs. I said, Tiny, do you think I ever get that? I'm a civilian, man. Do you think 99% of the people get what you get? You should count your lucky stars, baby. Look what you got. And you're complaining about whatever issue it was, this, this, or this. And I would make it more in depth than that. And he would sit there and look at me and go, Mr. Flynn, oh my God. Oh, you're so right. Oh Lord, please forgive me for complaining. But that's how I would get to just common sense. Just common sense. Tiny, look what you got and the rest of us don't. Come on, man. It could be a lot worse, okay? Yeah. Your problem, most people wish they had your problems, baby. Good, Dan. You know, you, you mentioned the street performer and that got me thinking. You hear, and most of them are exaggerated because that happens all the time in the entertainment business, all these stories about people getting found, you know, playing at a mall or outside this. How often is it that an agent or a manager finds that kind of talent? Or is that one of those one in a million that just gets, you know, over the Hallmark Channel overly used tropes? Well, from my perspective, in my history, very, very few. I mean... Very, very few. I, I know I know there have been, and I've read about it, but it's not been in my experience, okay? Stephen, there was a, a story, and I'm going to give it back to Dan. There was a story um, of Lana Turner being discovered at Schwab's drugstore. I've heard it like everybody has. <laughs> okay. Um, a young girl, a, apparently an aspiring actress at the time, Sitting there drinking a soda at the soda fountain at Schwab's drugstore in LA. And uh and just happened that that Louis B. Mayer or uh one of the uh the Metro Golden Mayer crew walked in. I think it might have been Louis B. Mayer, walked in and discovered this young lady named Lana Turner. That that notion of being discovered at the <laughs> at the soda fountain or being discovered, uh, you know, playing your guitar on the street corner. 
that's you know few and far in between as Dan pointed out. Oh damn but, right. Remember John uh, Wayne? John Wayne was discovered that way. True. I forgot about that. Yeah. He was working on the lot and a delivery guy, right? Yeah. As the story you're right. goes, as I remember it. And they said, I don't know who it was, but oh my God, you could be in pictures. Yeah, there you go. You're, so you know what, Stephen? I forgot about that, and you are absolutely right. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, then, then to continue that narrative, uh, well, I guess to kind of change it up a little bit as well, with what you were talking about uh, with knowing people, you, when you started your story, you said how you covered all the small lounge bands and everything. Sure. Um, how does that, you were 21 years old, maybe that's right. a different time, but how does a young kid like that get, how do you, how would you get into the business if you're, 20 years old, 18, whatever. I'm, I want to be an agent. I want to get into the, how do you do that? Do you, well, in today's world, like a normal, does it know somebody who knows somebody? How does that, how does that happen? In today's world, my opinion is almost impossible. It's a whole different era. When I did, that was 1971. Okay. 71. There was no technology. There was, I mean, you went to a lounge to enjoy yourself, get drunk, hustle a girl and watch a band, right? Today, there's videos, there's this. All that shit went out with mud flaps and fender skirts, okay? <laughs> okay. I started out, see, as a singer in my own band when I was 15 years old. And that band lasted the same cats all through high school and through two years, seven years, my band, right? And we played all over the Midwest. And we were pretty damn good in the end. And then we, we would open for big band, you know, for a big act. And to open for a big show, right, was like, oh, my God, I've made it, you know? What and was your first record, Stephen? For what it's worth. I knew you were going to say that. I'm going to tell you why. I actually searched you out. I found that song. Did you? I did. <laughs> I was yeah, 19. I sure I was did. Years old. I was 19 years old. We recorded that. I was a freshman in college. We recorded that. We got all our money together. We went to Chicago. Chess Checker Cadet Studios. Remember that? Famous. Yep. Yes, right. sir. And that's where we did it. An old Buffalo Springfield tune, and we updid it. Yes. That yes. was my a tribute to my one hit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, at least you were a one hit wonder. There's a lot of people that was a no hit wonder. I was a one hit baby. There you go. <laughs> I got news for you. Some of the some of the greatest songs in the world are one hit wonders. Oh yeah, there's you know? yeah, there's a whole history of that. Who could yeah. forget? You know, Terry Jack, Season in the Sun. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan's too young to know that one. You know that that's I as an avid lover of music. I'll still admit that's before my time. Hey, friend and lover, friend and lover. Yes. Reach there out in the darkness. Huh? Remember that? That was a top yeah, 10 here hit. Yeah, you go, Dan. Terry Jacks, Seasons in the Sun. You remember that one, Stephen? I do. They basically. wore the hell out of that. <laughs> Almost as bad as tiptoe through the tulips. <laughs> so let's talk about, we're going to transition now. We're going to talk about Stephen Klim managing 101, agenting 101. There are people called managing agents that do both. Colonel Tom Parker is the classic example of that. However, not these people aren't getting 50% of their clients take right. uh, like the Colonel was. <laughs> but managing agents are guys that do both. Is that a slippery slope, Stephen? Do you walk a, sl a tight rope? If you try to finagle, juggle the, both of these sometimes conflicting duties. I wouldn't want to do it, but I've known people that have. And I think <clears throat> what you just said, slippery slope. You can get in trouble, whether it be on the buyer side or your age. Where's your, where's your loyalty? You got to split it up, man. You're, you're busting up. I like exclusivity. If I'm going to manage you, nobody else is. And then nobody can get in my way. Because I'm not going to work my ass off for you and have some other guy down the line in a year or two take advantage of all the work I've done. Daniel. Yes, sir. You're an aspiring showbiz agent. Okay. You come to Stephen M. Plim. The M stands for money. You come to Stephen Thank M. 
or lack and you of. say, Mr. Plim, <laughs> I know who you are. You're famous, sir. You're a, one of the, the you know most talked about agents and managers in the business. I want to be just like you. Teach me what you know. What's the first thing Daniel has to ask Mr. Plim? I have those calls even today. I know you do. That's why I want, I'm trying to get Dan a job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dan, let's go yes, on the sir. road, babe. Let's go on the road and make it, baby. <laughs> That's what we always used to say. We're going on the road, man. We're going to make it. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, not for nothing, but I, I was on the road. I lived out of a suitcase for years. So, did so I, Dan, baby. you want to be an agent. So what are you going to, what's the first thing you're going to, what, the first piece of advice you're going to ask Stephen M. M is for money, Plim. What are you going to ask this man? What do you want to know? What does he have to teach you? Well, if I'm going to be an aspiring agent, the obvious question is how do you go about booking your first band? Or first well, act? Yeah. You, you got to get out. <clears throat> you got to get out in the barnyard and stomp in the shit. Search, knock on doors, and you better be tough because, baby, it ain't easy. I did it. I know a lot of guys that have. And I know a lot of guys that were very good at it, but just became so worn out, man, with it. And uh, disenchanted with all the crap you have to put up with. And they drop like flies, just like bands drop like. I've probably handled in my life, well, thousands of bands, thousands talking to them, coaching them, putting them together, helping them rehearse, booking them, babysitting them, loaning them money. Uh, so they're broke. Keep your commission. I don't need it this week. Feed your guys. You know what I mean? It's a, man, it's a real convoluted, hairy deal. It's not, you just can't explain it in one sentence or even in that. You just got to start somewhere. If, that, if that's where your heart is, then you'll figure out, you'll figure out if you want it bad enough, You'll figure out how to start. Well, let me ask you then. We uh, Angelo mentioned earlier to you about lawyers and you know the old <laughs> expression about a fool for a client and all. There's a certain degree of morality that you have to leave at the door in order to be a good attorney. It, that's what an true. Understatement. I, I, what I have an friends that, that do this, and and I'm not lying. It's it's you know so it's the same thing with managing. And and agenting, you hear stories about guys that, you know, uh, basically, I'll give you all the drugs and women you want. And the second that you're not making me money anymore, I'm on to a new client where, yeah. where they, you know, you, you talked about the guys that, that made all their money treating tiny like crap. Um, it, what kind of, for lack of a better description, is it possible to be really a, a good manager or a good agent while still w without having to abandon some semblance of, of more somewhere? It. Great fucking question. Great I am question. so glad he asked that. How about politicians? What do you think they do every day? <laughs> okay. There right. you go. They claim to be moral. This and, and, and maybe they are in most cases. But you ain't going to get nothing if you don't give up something. Let you me remind have everybody. You cannot have it your way all the time. It, it ain't going to happen. So, yeah, you got to, I'll use the word compromise. Yeah. Okay. Well, Stephen, you and I remember because we're of that generation. Yeah. You and I remember, and I remember from firsthand because I got involved in it. Um, the payola situation. You remember? Oh, yeah. remember Dick yes, Clark? Sir. Yeah. Dick Clark. Well, it it lived long past Dick Clark. Um, one and what Stephen and I are talking about. There was a a. A chapter in American music where record companies wanted certain artists promoted or pushed, like you know, to, to uh, equate this to the wrestling business. You know, there are people gunning for you at the top of the roster, they want your spot. And the record companies used to have these sometimes, most of the time, unknown artists that they would put a lot of money behind 
to have their records played over and over and over again on radio stations, big city radio stations, Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles, you know, all these big stations at Chicago. Um, and they would have, you know, these rally parties for these, you know, unknown artists who create. I got sucked up into that, too, because I was playing. I was being given. And I'll just tell you straight up because it's you know past history. They were sticking hundred dollar bills in the record sleeve, Steve. Yeah. And you know that. I do know that. Yeah. And I've got a lot of them hundred dollar bills, brother. <laughs> you know, a lot of them. And uh, but talk to me about to follow up on Dan's question. And I want Dan to pursue that line of question about how you maintain your integrity, I think is what Dan's saying. Mm. How do you maintain your integrity in a basically like wrestling, Dan, a corrupt, moralist uh, enterprise? Right. I had one thing, guiding thing uh, with me, and it was simple. Never, ever fuck your artist. If somebody's got to go down, it ain't going to be them. So I went from there. Never, ever screwed my artist. If I had to make deals that were unseemly, I did. Uh, if I had to compromise, you want to say compromise some of my morals in different areas. <clears throat> now, I don't mean murder or something, but you know what I mean. Oh, okay, right. I did. I admit it. Otherwise, you ain't going to play ball in the big leagues, man. You just ain't going to. But I never screwed Stephen, it happens. And I'm glad you said that, Stephen, because it happens in wrestling. Dan can tell you it happens in wrestling all the time, brother. Oh, I mean, all the time. And, and, that, and that's why I think there's this, you know, as much as the, the wrestling business and, uh, and the music business may think they're, you know, separate and apart from each other. There's a lot of similarities. They are kindred spirits. I got news for you. Um, one of the things that uh, that I wanted to talk about is, uh, and Dan had, had brought up the subject. I, I don't, you know what? I want Dan to, 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 to go, because I've been not talking too much tonight. I'm not really used to that. Um, shut up, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not used to talk. Yeah, of course. It's like him when it's like shut him up or let Dan talk. <laughs> but go ahead, Dan. Pursue that line. Well, the you, we're still talking about the shady ethical uh, behavior, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you maintain you know your uh, good standing in the business? I mean, let, me give you, let me give you one example. Okay. okay, this is just one example. Okay, and I can give you many, but I'm, I'm not going to name names, of course. But okay. I used to book a lot of acts in Las Vegas on the strip, right? Mm -hmm. Lounge acts, right? Yes, sir. You go through the entertainment director at the hotel. You take him out for dinner. You pay for it. You schmooze him. You buy him booze. You bring him to see your act. He says, okay, you get a deal. And then you go in uh, the bathroom or locker room or whatever. And he goes, you know, when you get paid on Friday, I want 100. And you do it. Mm -hmm. it was pay to play. Thank you. That's the term. So you're, you're, you're basically bribing him to, to continue his, his end of the deal. Well, he's extorting me. Okay. But it's different, Dan. I'm going to interject. And, and because Stephen used a term, there's a difference between bribery, which is illegal. Believe it or not, it's still illegal. And the difference between what's referred to, and this is a legal term, it's called pay for play. That's right. And it's it's in contracts. It's what it's called a pay for play contract. It's legal bribery. It's essentially Stephen was what it is. Yeah. And we both know it. But that was the way you did it. And if you didn't do it, your act wasn't going to go on stage in Las Vegas, man. Yeah, and even in the film business, there are, you know, uh, actors who became stars because of five picture pay or play deals. You know the deal. Which you know the routine. Meant, yeah. Yeah. That was that was the routine, 
man. Exactly. It was the norm. It was the norm, not the exception. Exactly. And, and I'll tell you another thing. Uh, going along those lines, guys, like uh, major newspaper columnists, entertainment, right, columnists, if your name was in their thing, you look big and more people come to your show, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can't tell you how many times, like if I'd have an act somewhere, I'd write the copy, take it to the guy with a $50 bill and go, print this. Well, wait a minute now, Stephen. Let's let's pick up where you are because I'm going to keep you there. And it goes back to the 30s and 40s. Let's let's uh, tell everybody about a woman named Hedda Hopper. Oh God! Yeah, let's yeah. tell everybody about uh, uh, Walter Winchell. Let's tell everybody about Rona Barrett, Rex Reed, um, Cisco you know Ebert. Oh, okay, you know yeah, all of them. They yeah. all did the same thing. It was the they norm, took, man. Exactly. They all took a little bit of green. And you hate it, but you, sir, you, you, you soon learn to accept it. It's like an insurance policy. You yeah. do that or you don't play. What am I going to tell my act? I can't get you booked? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know what the competition is? If you don't, somebody's right in line to take that job and pay. Yeah. You know? Go ahead, Dan. Then, um, moving to we we just bounced on the past. I'm curious from everything we've described to a lot of the 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 back stuff in the modern era with streaming and digital music and everything. How has that impacted the role of the manager and the agent and the booker? Where uh, acts that are making millions of dollars might not ever play a show. Damn, he always gets one in there that I wish the hell I'd ask. Damn it. <laughs> Damn. You know, Dan the man is too cerebral for me, man. You know, he <laughs> asks really deep shit. This is why we call him the smartest man in the room. I believe it. Why <laughs> do you think he's got to wear a hat every episode? It's to keep his fucking brain in. You know? I'll, I'll probably I'll probably end up getting a hitman from Vegas tonight at my door. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, you guys. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry. What was the? I'm the, sorry. The, the question in the modern era with streaming and digital music and and YouTube and everything, you have artists. Even though you hear stories of oh, they're only making a few cents per stream or whatever, artists that can get million dollar, make, literally make millions of dollars without ever playing a live show. How does how has the modern digital age influenced the role of the manager and the booker and the agent? Well, in some ways, it's made it easier. In some ways, it's made it harder. The guys that are already big and have bit the big acts, hey, it's just more, baby, here we go. You know, open up the cage. New cats coming along the way, they don't have the connections or the backing, right? You need money, too, mm-hmm. to acquire that, those kind of resources and, and networking. So it works either side of the street. Guys that are already big, and it's just another gold mine. And it's easy street. It's an easier street. I'll put it that way. Well, then if, if I can continue down that row, uh, you mentioned earlier, I think it was, excuse me, Angelo, you mentioned earlier the the, the Dick Clark era. And, you know, the, it was common in the record days, you guys know, performers were paid peanuts and ev- the studios owned and ran everything. It's very right. similar now with the streaming rights where you'll write a song and perform it and be famous and you might get – fractions of a penny per play of that music yeah. while the studios are making money hand over fist it's all, we've gone full circle back to the way things were in the 50s and 60s i'm curious Stephen, if you have any insight on on that how it's it's actually harder from what artists will say to make it in oh, the modern I, era. can i interject Stephen? of course, of course. Stephen, i'll give it to you but i i want to interject because i'm no, going to go there for interjecting because i didn't know how to answer his damn question <laughs> what <Well, laughs> <laughs> I'm you gonna go there. Up. Here's what I think, and and I'm I think this because of what I've observed. I think, especially now in the digital age, with with like Vimeo, YouTube, uh, all of these streaming outlets where you can record your own original stuff, you've got YouTubers that are millionaires who right. don't have to leave their bedroom. Right. Okay. That they they 
play and perform and they they do originals and they've got sponsors. How they got sponsors and subscribers and people are paying them. I'll tell you, I'm Dan. talking Steven, I'm talking about 17, 18 year old kids that are like millionaires from yeah. YouTube. I'm I'm hip to that and I'm gonna tell you something and straight out, right? Yeah. I'm an old war horse, man. I'm what you call an anachronism, something in the past still living and functioning today. We had our way of doing it all the years. I don't know the answer to your question, Dan the Man, because the current thing that you're talking about right now, I haven't been involved in. Okay. So to be honest with you, I don't know, man. I know, just like Angelo said, they're all making, I don't know how it works. I do not know how all that works. Yeah, well, I don't know how it works, Dan, but uh, but I know, Dan, that that they are making some serious scratch. Now, if if Dan, if you go to Steven and you say, Mr. Plim, I'm a talented tap dancer. I want you to represent me. I'll bet you the first thing Stephen Plim's going to say, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Stephen, but the first thing you're going to tell him is, son, you Got to get yourself out there, get a website, and get yourself discovered. Exactly. Exactly. If you don't have a website today, you don't have a platform to do shit. <laughs> talk to That's everybody, Stephen. Uh, talk to everybody, uh, Stephen, about how aspiring artists, dancers, singers, actors, actresses um, can utilize the internet, and this is something you and Dan can talk about because he's young and hip and I'm not. Um, so go ahead, talk, talk, you and Dan have, a, have that conversation and I'll drink I, my coffee. All I can tell you is this, uh, Dan, uh, I get calls, I don't know how many a week, just because I'm out there mm -hmm. uh, with all my stuff and I have history and people will call me every week, whether it's a singer, dancer, usually musicians. Uh, will you handle me? Here's what I do. I don't take any any new artists on unless they already have something going. I've done that in the past. I'm not going to start over. You know, right. I tell them. I tell my my advice is whatever you need to know from me. I'm an open book to you, and I would love to help you with what I know and my knowledge to help you because other people have helped me. So I can answer your questions as best I can. But then I got to tell you. If you really want this, uh, you better get on your horse and ride, man. And you better and get to New York or get to L.A. where the action is, because if you're not going to be seen, if you're not going to be exposed, you ain't got shit. And get yourself a website. Do you have pictures? Do you have a portfolio? What do you got so far? You know, and then you got to go out and literally knock on doors. Yeah, you can do a lot of it on the Internet, but that's just bullshit because they, they don't even look at it. You got to be you got to persevere, man. You got to want it like you want to live, okay? Like it's your life. And you go meet people and knock on doors and here's who I am and here's my portfolio. And you just got to do it. I, just recently, uh, in the last month, I've helped three girls uh, do this and go to LA from small towns. And I tell them, I said, when you go into LA, right, with your U Haul and you're going to make it, right? If you stand in that spot long enough, You'll see that you haul going back somewhere. Exactly. That's your chances. Slim and none. Now, do you still want to do it? And if they say, yeah, I say, God bless you. What do you need from me? I'll help you any way I can. Stephen, can I ask you a question? Yep. Used to be a time, and, and, and Dan, you know this too, even in the wrestling business. There used to be a time that you would take your 8x10 and your tape. <laughs> and you would, you know where I'm yep. going, Stephen. Exactly, okay. baby. You yeah. know where I'm going, Dan. Yes, sir. And now, everybody now is, everything's digital. It's all email. It's yeah. all, now they don't send you a picture and a tape. Now they send you a link by text. Here's my YouTube. Here's my, you know, used to be called Sizzle Reel. Now yes. it's called Sizzle Reel. Yeah, man. Sizzle Reel. Right. Now they call them. I haven't heard that terminology in a while. I'm because I'm old. That's why. Well, so am I. <laughs> well, it's it's also uh, we've I mean, we've we've seen it, and then I had um, 
uh, when I had Mustafa Gadalori on on the round table about a month ago, uh, he was telling the story. Every, almost every audition that's done nowadays, you don't go to a casting director. They'll they'll put out a mass email. We're looking for, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z. And you mm -hmm. say, because now it's so easy to make, people send in their own demo tapes. You know, I can, exactly. I've got a smartphone. I can record with this. I can record a professional quality demo reel, few minutes of me reading a line that you emailed me, and I never have to leave the house. It, it, so exactly, it becomes. Exactly, Dan, what I was, what I was, and I'm thank you for going there because that's exactly what I wanted you and. Stephen, to talk about Stephen, there was a time you, if you wanted to be, uh, you know, the the next big thing, you had to hire a camera crew, you had to spend money for for tapes and headshots, and you had to you had to get on the bus or take a plane or whatever the hell you had to go crisscrossing all over the place. Now, you know, Dan and I can sit in our living room and. People around yep. the world can they, see us now. You know, they you, they don't have it really anymore. Being a child of the 80s, the MTV generation, I remember every shopping mall, strip mall, and area had a shop who existed just to make a, a, a music videos. Like, exactly. You, you'd bring your garage band to this place, and they would make kind of a semi-amateur, semi-professional, whatever you want to call it, music video that you could now take and just distribute to people. Yeah, I remember when I got my first Walkman in 83. <laughs> Jesus, I thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. Right? Right. I remember them. Now, now you know, we we walk around with, you know, uh, you know like a five gig computer in our pocket. You know, I don't I, I, I get lost in my background. I have to hold my phone Thousands, up like thousands <laughs> of songs. But you know, yeah, but here's the thing though. Um, no, but you guys are you're absolutely right, Stephen. I, I know that. I want to tell people because because uh, I'm going to give uh, Stephen M. Plim, <clears throat> the M stands for money, and his <laughs> partner Jacob, because uh, I know Jacob is in the background lurking there, running the computers and shit. And he did, and he just went up to the bathroom. <laughs> hey, Jacob, get down here. They're talking about you. But I want to, I this want everyone nice to thing, know that I can call him from the bathroom. Clint, well, he's in the right place. Yeah, he's up. he's yeah. in the right place. I'm talking about him. He's in absolutely okay. he's in the right place. Here, here he is, Angelo. He's right here. It's like I left for two seconds. Yeah, Stephen Plim and and Jacob, his partner Jacob, uh, they are. Uh, two guys that you want to know if you want to be in the business if you think you've got the talent get a hold of Stephen M. Plim and get a hold of Jacob Jacob is one hell of a web designer he is a web man. he will build you a professional top notch state of the art entertainment website to promote yourself like nobody's business and when you are ready Stephen Plim will look at you he will assess you and size you up and if you are lucky enough to have Stephen Plim represent you you're going to go someplace so and I just wanted to throw that out there Stephen I know you didn't expect that tonight but not at all but thanks for the plug and thank you for your yeah. thank you for your well, kindness I, you know look I got it See, here's the thing. We're Dan and I are all about promoting the unsung hero. You know, I know you're the face of the crew, but let's be honest about it. Jacob's the guy doing all the hard work back there. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> not wrong. It's not wrong. I tell you. I know I'm not <laughs> wrong. Jacob, I know that. I know the deal, brother. I know the deal. Go ahead, Dan, talk. <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> It's actually funny. Got me thinking. You, you were great. talking. You were talking earlier. You mentioned uh, the formats. You know, 2019 was the first year that vinyl outsold CD. First time ever since both those formats have existed. Because we're coming full circle back to back to vinyl. Um, I, I'm curious, and this is just kind of, uh, to go off of what you said with you know, get a website, get your information. You you won't take anybody off the street. But but really, hypothetically speaking. What would it take 
for for you to walk you're walking down the street, somebody's performing, you hear somebody in a club or whatever. What would it take? For you to pick up somebody that's that's from scratch, nothing, zero, right off the street. A lot of dead presidents. <laughs> a lot of dead presidents. So, so if they came to you with talent and a duffel bag full of money, you'd think about it. I, If they had the money. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to lie to you? No, I, I was just, I was genuinely yeah. curious. If there's no, there's no level of talent that, that you hear that you would do it's all, you'd be willing to do all the work. Number one, I'm not looking, and I'm not walking down the streets. It, it, uh, it's not in my DNA anymore to do so. I wish them all well, believe me. I wish them all well, guys. I really do. Oh, but absolutely. all those years are past me. I have my history, and now I'm doing what I do. And uh, I usually, you know, I go out and speak and do MC jobs, you know, eight, yeah. nine of them a month until this COVID thing come on, you know. I am live way, shows. Stephen Plim, let me, let me stop you there, Stephen, because you you said something, and I want to make sure that it's fresh when I say this. All Stephen right. Plim is a a master of ceremonies, a skilled, by the way, skilled master of ceremonies. He is also um, a motivational speaker. He's a great storyteller. His tales from Hollywood will uh, will captivate you. He could talk to you for hours about. You know, the ins and outs and some things you don't know about some of your favorite artists. Um, if you want to hire Stephen M. Plim, it's as simple as going to StephenMPlim.com. That's it. The M stands for money. Angela, can I ask you a question? Of course you can. Will you please be my agent? I love you. I, uh, I'm pretty good that way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, look, I just I just put you over. It's like we call in wrestling putting somebody over, right, Dan? Right. The art of putting someone over. Well, you That's know, and I think I think we get a return on investment for the wrestling term of uh, putting butts in the seats because uh, first first time we had Steven on the show and put him over by the by the by the next show we recorded we had something 30, 40 some new uh, requests for the Facebook group. He brought oh, he brought really? the crowds. Yeah, and more today, by the way, Stephen. That makes me feel good. Seriously, th that's yeah. nice. That's eleven nice to more today. Nice to all admit. referred by Stephen Plim. I'm not even shitting you. I'm well, not even shitting you. Straight shoot. Makes me feel Straight. good. Thank you. We pick a Dan and I joke about it, but it's really the truth. We we do a talk show. This is just like you know, wrestling just happens to creep in once in a while. <laughs> but this is what we really like to do. And, uh, and we're going to be doing a lot more of this. Steven, I want to bring you back. Um, I promised everybody three appearances by you. We're going to bring you back one more time. Uh, I think it was like three weeks. Is that what we said? About every three weeks or so, right? Something like that. Yeah, whatever you want, Angela. Okay, so we're going to bring you in three weeks. Um, we're going to have uh, one more episode with Steven Plim. And we're going, that episode is going to be a peek behind the curtain. Steven's going to talk about some of the people he's handled and some of the horror stories he's had to deal with. And quite frankly, he's going to tell you some of the most rewarding stuff. I like uh, that. That'll be fun. About being, about being an agent and manager. And, uh, you know, just on, that, on, on that note, you know, and I can't wait to do that segment because a lot of these cats, interesting were big stars and then fell or and I would pick them up in the middle but the greatest rap the greatest line I ever heard I was at the Fountain Blue in Miami Beach I had George Burns there right we had dinner yeah. and he looked at me and he said hey kid I've been rich and I've been poor rich is better always remember that exactly exactly absolutely uh -huh. yep. well you guys uh, we have come to uh the end of another episode. Stephen, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. I will, uh, of course, touch base with you tomorrow. Dan, what's going on in the world of uh, Dan the Man and Twitter and all of our social stuff? What's happening? Well, uh, like I said, we're Facebook group, Wrestling with the Future on Facebook. We're uh, growing every day, especially when we have awesome guests like Stephen here. Uh, we're on Twitter at Wrestling Future. That's no G, Wrestling Future. We're on Instagram, Wrestling with the Future. We have uh, quite a social media profile. You just posted on the Facebook page. You talk about upcoming events. We've confirmed uh, 
one half of the killer bees, somebody that we were looking forward to. We, we've mentioned a few times talking about, I know I'm sure you'll go on for future guests. So any of the breaking news of sorts for the show is always on our social media. Absolutely. And uh, Dan uh, can give you a little hint there. B. Brian Blair will be with us on Tuesday, September 29th. One half of the Killer Bees. He is the president and CEO of the Cauliflower Alley Club, the oldest organization in pro wrestling, the Ring of Friendship. Uh, and we are going to promote that organization. We're going to talk about Cauliflower Alley, talk about Brian's career. He's a fascinating guy. But before we get to next Tuesday... We got a humdinger, baby. Thursday night. Thursday night. The man who redefined wrestling. And he <laughs> really, really did. He blew the lid off of K Fabe. K Fabe died when Eddie Mansfield hit the airwaves. And Eddie Mansfield will be our guest on Thursday night. It promises to be a barn burner. He says we're going to have, he says to me, and I'm going to quote, Eddie Mansfield says, Angelo, we're going to have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm looking forward to it. I know Dan's looking forward to it. Um, I just, I hope, I hope Eddie's ready for Dan. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> but we are both ready for a word from our sponsor. Let me tell you something. I want to move out the way. Because, Stephen Plim, you don't know this. But you've got smooth balls underneath your face. Look at that. Watch this. All right. Look at that. Do you have sweaty balls? <laughs> Volleyball, netty balls. <laughs> well, it's time to make them ready balls. The Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0 will do the job and clean your knob. <laughs> its patented no nick head will ensure that your head functions as desired. Enter promo code Wrestling Future. For 20% off, that's a generous 20% off your order. And manscaped.com and wrestling with the future going balls to the walls at manscaped.com. <laughs> your balls will thank you. And so will we. And on you that note, for Stephen Plim, for Dan the Man Spaziano, I'm Angelo DeCipio. Take care, everybody. Good night. Happy wrestling. God bless, guys. Thank you. Thank you.